is, is there a principal reason why I should delete my social media? And if so, what is it? Mm. There are two. One of them is for your own good, and the other is for society's good. For your own good, it's because you're being subtly manipulated by algorithms that are watching everything you do constantly and then sending you changes in your media feed, in your diet, that are calculated to adjust you slightly to the liking of some unseen advertiser. And so if you get off that, you can have a chance to experience a clearer view of yourself and your life. Uh, but then the, the reason for society might be even more important. Society has been gradually darkened by this scheme in which everyone is under surveillance all the time and everyone is under this mild version of behavior modification all the time. It, it's made people jittery and cranky. It's made uh, teens especially depressed, which can be quite severe. But it's made our politics kind of unreal and strange, where we're not sure if elections are real anymore. We're not sure how much the Russians affected Brexit. We do know that it was a crankier affair than it might have been otherwise. You say it's bad for me as an individual. Is it bad for me because I'm addicted? Have I become chemically hooked? You have. Uh, the founders of the great Silicon Valley spying empires like Facebook have publicly declared that they intentionally included addictive schemes in, in their designs. Now, we have to say, this is what I would call almost a stealthy addiction. It's, it's a statistical addiction. What it says is, we will get the broad population to use the services a lot, we'll get them hooked through a scheme of rewards and punishment. Uh, and the, 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 the rewards are when you're retweeted, the punishment is when you're treated badly by others online. And then within that, we'll very gradually start to, to leverage that to change them. So it's, it's, this, it's this very kind of stealthy manipulation of the population. So it's not as dramatic as a heroin addict or a gambling addict, but it is the same principle. But who's, who's doing the manipulating? I mean, it, there isn't some master sort of Wizard of Oz sitting behind a screen, is there? Well, this is the peculiarity of the situation. The people who run the tech companies like Google and Facebook are not doing the manipulating. They're doing the addicting. <laughs> but the manipulating, which rides on the back of the addicting, is the paying customer of, of, of such a company. So, uh, and and uh, many of those customers are not at all bad influences. They might simply be trying to promote their cars or their perfumes or whatever. And indeed, I have sympathy for them because they're concerned that if they don't put money into the system, nobody will know about them anymore. How is it different to just television advertising or billboard advertising mm. or anything else? The difference is the, the constant feedback loop. So when you watch the television, the television isn't watching you. When you see the billboard, the billboard isn't seeing you. And vast numbers of people see the same thing on television and see the same billboard. When you use these new designs, social media, search, uh, YouTube, when you see these things, you're being observed constantly and algorithms are taking that information and changing what you see next. And they're searching and searching and searching and, and they're just blind robots. There's no evil genius here until they find those patterns, those, those little tricks that get you and make you change your behavior. In terms of society, I mean, you, you, you threw in this, you know, it's making people depressed. But is there any actual evidence for that? Yeah, unfortunately, there's a vast amount of evidence. There have been dozens of studies at this point, um, including studies released by Facebook scientists. So this is, this is something we can call a consensus. And, and when Facebook releases such things, they say, oh, but we do all these good things, too, that balance it. But there's, there's a general acknowledgement that uh, depression correlates. Uh, the scariest uh, example is a correlation between rises in uh, teen suicide and the, and the rise in use of social media. And so, yes, unfortunately, this is real. But are you sure you can blame it on social media? Is it, is it not just those two things may have happened at the same time for other reasons? <laughs> 
Well, here's a distinction we have to make. It's very similar to the problem of global climate change. We can say statistically over the whole population, yes, the correlation is real. In any particular person, of course, we can't, just as we can't blame any particular storm on global warming. But it's causality, isn't it? Yeah, it, yeah I mean, uh, it is causality, and it's, this is something that's very well demonstrated. Uh, so uh, when the company's own scientists are publishing on, on this topic and come to the same agreement, I think it's time to say this is real. Why have you sort of turned on your own kind, if you like? I love Silicon Valley, and I do not at all feel that I've turned on my own kind. And just to be clear, I'm very much a part of this. I, I've sold a company to Google. I'm not in any sense an outsider. I believe that what we're doing is not in our own self-interest. Uh, <laughs> business interests are a part of society. If they destroy society, they destroy themselves. I believe it's very clear that we could offer all of the good things, and there are many, many good things in these services, and social media in particular. I'm convinced we can offer them without this manipulation engine in the background. There's a world of other business plans, and I think they'd be better for us. So I, I, I don't think we're being evil so much as we're being stupid. When it comes to Facebook, has Facebook made itself safe yet in terms of data harvesting and scraping and all of that? Well, um, Facebook's fundamental design is one that is, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, the business model is to addict you and then offer a channel to you to third parties to take advantage of that, to change you in some way without you realizing it's happening. I mean, that's, that's what it does. So I don't think any amount of tweaking can uh, fully heal it. I think it needs a different business plan. I mean, it's very hard to throw a barrage of rules at somebody who's following certain incentives and then expect them to really make a difference. So when Mark Zuckerberg says he's taking action and, you know, he regrets what's happened and all the rest of it, you're saying he can't make his own product a safe and desirable product? I believe that as long as his business incentives are contrary to the interests of the people who use it, who are different from the customers, uh, then no matter how sincere he is, and I believe he's, he's sincere, and no matter how uh, clever he is, he can't undo that problem. He has to go back to the basics and change the nature of the business plan. And if he, if he doesn't agree with that and says, we're just going to carry on, how, much of an, how, how, how important is security of that data uh, and the inability to repeat what has happened with Cambridge Analytica and all that kind of sort of data harvesting that went on. I don't believe that this is, I don't believe that what happened with Cambridge Analytica is the worst of it. Uh, the whole system is designed for this. Like, let's suppose that Facebook reforms itself so that the next Cambridge Analytica can't get access to that data. They can still get access to the same results because the service Facebook offers is exactly what Cambridge they do Analytica. It themselves. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, um, there are uh, bad actors are, 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 are able to use Facebook in ways that Facebook can't understand because the way the service is designed is fundamentally to be manipulative. So I think the data protection idea is a sincere and good idea, but it's certainly not adequate. It doesn't address the core problem, which is the manipulation engine. And as long as that is there, a bad actor can find a way to utilize it. So uh, to me, this, this concern about data protection, while laudable, doesn't address the core problem. Do you think they're all as bad as each other? I mean, you know, why is something like YouTube, mm -hmm. which is basically just a way of watching video, mm -hmm. bad for you? YouTube is not necessarily bad for you. Uh, remember, this is a statistical distribution. So for some percentage of people, it'll have an effect of making them uh, crankier around election time and feeling needier around the time they might be making a purchase and so forth. And the way it works is that all the data Google can get on you, much of which comes from um, just your email or, or whatever else it might be, is fed into an engine that compares you with other people who share some similar traits. And YouTube's ordering of videos that are presented to you 
is designed to, on the one hand, maximize your engagement so you won't stop watching, but that's achieved not just by observing you, but by a multitude of people who are similar to you. And then when you do get an ad, it's contextualized in a way that has been shown to be effective, not only for you, but for this whole population. So it's this giant statistical thing. And it's bad for you because it leeches your free will, it makes you cranky, it, it makes the world a little darker because you're not perceiving reality clearly anymore. You're be, it's being uh, manipulated. It's being uh, tricked in a way. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the, the people who are paying or maybe not paying, just using the system to, uh, in a clever way to get at you are not necessarily um, pleasant people. They're, they're, they're sort of the worst actors in some cases. But don't, don't some users think, look, I can handle advertising. You know, I know what I'm doing here. I'm getting a free service. Uh, and, you know, they think they're manipulating me, but I know what I'm doing. The problem is that behaviorist techniques are often invisible to the person who's being manipulated. And, and this has a long history. This has been done for a long time. Uh, it used to be that the only way to be subjected to continuous observation and modification was to either be in an experiment uh, you could be in the basement of a psychology building and have students tweaking you for their projects, or you could join a cult, or you could be in an abusive relationship. I mean, this has been done before, and often the people who are in these situations do not realize it's happening to them. In fact, the whole point is that it's it's sneaky. It's, it's, a, it's a mechanical approach to manipulating people, and because it's, it's so algorithmic, it doesn't involve direct communication, and people don't get the cues to understand what's happening with them. Why do you think um, social media has had the effect on politics that it has? You know, is, is it because of the way people respond to things on social media? Well, uh, I'd like to give you a slightly detailed answer as quickly as I can. And that is that uh, in traditional behaviorism, you would give an animal or a person a little treat like candy or maybe an electric shock, and you'd go back and forth between positive and negative feedback. And when researchers try to determine whether positivity or negativity is more powerful, they're roughly at parity. They're both important. But the difference with social media is that the algorithms that are are following you respond very quickly. They're looking for the quick responses. And the negative responses, like getting startled or scared or irritated or angry, tend to rise faster than the, uh, the positive responses, like building trust or feeling good. Those things rise more slowly. So the algorithms naturally catch the negativity and amplify it and introduce negative people to each other and all of this. And so what this does is it means that the algorithms discover there's more engagement possible, uh, say, by promoting ISIS and promoting the Arab Spring. And so ISIS gets more mileage or promoting uh, the Ku Klux Klan than Black Lives Matter. Now, in the big picture, it's not true that negativity is more powerful. But if you're doing this very rapid measurement of human impulses instead of accumulated human behavior, then it's the negativity that gets amplified. So you tend to have elections that are more driven by rancor and abuse, and you tend to have outcomes that are kind of crazy. And so the, the effects on the media we consume, the news, as well is also alarming because then it'll be the news that makes people angry that is the news that gets seen in the future or now rather than you know a, a more balanced diet of what's really going on in the world. Well, I think what goes on on a show like this is that you have a bit of a longer time horizon in, in, by which you measure success. So you're, you have to um, impress your viewership enough to tune in, but this is over a process of days and weeks and months and years, and you build up a sense of rapport with your, your viewership, right? Um, if you're an algorithm that's just looking at instant responses, you don't get that. It's just like, wh how did I engage this person? And it'll be, it, you'll, you'll find that engagement more often by irritating people than by educating them. And so is that how you create Trump? Uh, <clears throat> or Duterte well, or, you know, any of the other populist um, leaders who are doing very well at the moment, partly from the internet? I, I have never known Trump, but I have met him a few times over a fairly long period, over 30 years, actually, through different circumstances. And I will say that um, while I never would have voted for him as president, and I always thought he was... Um, 
somewhat <laughs> untrustworthy and a bit of a, a showman and a bit of a scammer. He never lost himself and became so strangely insecure and so weirdly um, um, irritable until he had his own addiction, in this case to Twitter. And it's, it's really damaged him. I mean, I, I view Trump in a way as a victim. Um, really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. His character has been really damaged by his Twitter addiction. Because of the reaction he gets from each tweet. Yeah, so you know what happens uh, in addiction is the addict becomes hooked not just on the good part of the addiction experience, but on the whole cycle. So a gambler is not just addicted to winning, but to this whole process where they mostly lose. And in the same way, uh, the Twitter addict or the social media addict becomes addicted to this engagement, which is often unpleasant where they're engaged in these, uh, you know, really abusive exchanges with other human beings. And only once in a while is that, you know, you'll, you can watch Trump, like every once in a while there'll be this tweet where somebody likes him and that's when he gets his little, uh, we call it in the trade, the dopamine hit. Uh, uh, that's what it's called in Facebook, for instance. He gets his little dopamine hit, and then he dives in for more negativity and things, then he gets it again. And you, you can see the addiction playing out. And do you think it's possible to create a do-gooding social network? Yes. I'm absolutely positive. And the way to do it is to have a different business model where instead of... So right now, we've created this bizarre society that's unprecedented where if any two people wish to communicate over the internet, the only way that can happen, the only way it's financed is through a third party who believes that those two can be manipulated in a sneaky way. It's, it's, a, it's an insane way to structure civilization. So we can keep all the good stuff, and there is good stuff on social media, of course. We can keep all that and just throw away the manipulation business model and substitute in a different business model. And, and there are many alternatives that would be better. They just have to be honest. Uh, it could be a paid service like a Netflix where you're paying for it. You're the genuine customer. It has to keep your interest. It could be like a public library. It could become a, a public thing that, is, uh, that isn't commercial at all. That's an option. Uh, but what we did in Silicon Valley is we wanted it both ways. We wanted everything open and free, but we wanted hero entrepreneurs and hackers. And so the only way to get that was this advertising thing that, that gradually turned into the manipulation engine as the computers got faster. And this, this weird business plan, it, once you can see that there are alternatives, you realize how strange it is and how unsustainable it is. This is the thing we must get rid of. We don't have to get rid of the smartphone. We don't have to get rid of the idea of social media. We just have to get rid of the manipulation machine that's in the background. Uh, just one last thing as well that is also obsessing parents at the moment. Um, screen time itself, mm -hmm. do you think that is a bad thing? Or is it just what's on the screen? Uh, to be um, frank with you, I struggle with this question because I have an 11-year-old. And so I, I tend to think that manipulation time when the kids are, are being observed by algorithms and tweaked by them is vastly worse than just screen time by itself. So... Uh, Do you include video games in, in, in the social media, you know, the things that are manipulating them? Because they are similarly addictive, aren't they? They're addictive but not manipulative typically. Now, there, I, here I'm not sure how evil we've become lately because <laughs> there might be some video games that are using behavior mod techniques for pay that's conceivable. I can see how that could happen. If you're thinking about it out there, don't do it, okay? <laughs> Find something better to do. But the, the mainstream video games are not doing that. They are addictive. So there are plenty of things that are addictive that aren't leveraging that for manipulation. So these are two different stages. What do you think of Fortnite? I have not played it. You know, I haven't played it. Because Fortnite is exactly that. It's getting people to pay for things within right. the game. No, but see, the thing is, getting them to pay is still not manipulating them for a third party. That's getting them to buy stuff. I mean, Amazon does that to get you to buy stuff. Uh, all kinds of people do that. that. That might be annoying. You might object to it, especially if you feel your kids are wasting money. You might object to it. You might feel it's not an ideal um, example of human behavior and character, and maybe there could be a better business, whatever. There, but it's not directly manipulating you, say, to influence an election. It's not trying to change your behavior out in the larger world. And, and that's the thing that's really tragic about designs like Facebook and Google. They are succeeding at doing that. But your advice tonight to everyone watching this is delete all your accounts. I would like to make two very quick pitches on that account. 
One, if you're a young person and you've only lived with social media, your first duty is to yourself. You have to know yourself. You should experience travel. You should experience challenge to yourself. You need to know yourself and you can't know yourself without perspective. So at least give it six months without social media and really quit them. Don't like quit Facebook to keep another Facebook thing like WhatsApp because then it's, it'll still be spying and manipulating. Get rid of the whole thing for six months and know yourself and then you can decide. I can't tell you what's right. You have to decide but you can't until you know yourself. And then for the rest of society, I'd say, as long as we can have some small percentage of people who are off it, then the society can have voices to give perspective. If everybody's universally part of this thing, we cannot have perspective. We cannot have a real conversation. And it's too lonely right now. <laughs> you know, We need more people who are just outside of that loop, who are thinking without the manipulation. And I think we'll find it extraordinarily valuable to have them. Are you just a new age hippie? I mean, have you just been through the mill and kind of worked out, I want to check out of all this and let's just, let's just stop? Um, do I seem new age to you? I don't know, I mean, you know. I mean, I, here, here's what, I'll tell you the bind you've put me in, is that I'd be happy to trash the new age and, uh, and demonstrate that I'm not part of that manner of thinking. I'm certainly not, I, think, I hope I've come across as a non-utopian. Um, but uh, the problem is many of my friends in California are quite new age, so I want to be kind to them. <laughs>